Hey everybody, Ben here. Uh, with the release of Blender 2.75, you can now do anaglyph renders, meaning the red cyan images that if you wear the red cyan glasses, you can see them in even more 3D than just the regular 3D that you've done in the past with Blender. Uh, if you follow through this entire tutorial at the end, you should have this, exactly this. This will be your final render. The tools for that are kind of spread out a bit in Blender. They're in uh, at least three different locations. So uh, I'll take you through all of those. In order to go through this tutorial, you are going to have to download from BlendSwap this file here. I'll put the link to it in the description of this tutorial. Plunderbus Pete. I think I'm saying that right. By Ben Danzi, who is extremely good. Uh, has worked on the Blender Foundation films and things like that. He's, he's really talented and he's super kind, has made this a CC0 license, which means you can pretty much do anything you want with this and uh, he's cool with it. It's a really nice sculpt that he's done for us. So go on to BlendSwap. You'll have to log in and download that. If you haven't, if you haven't used BlendSwap, uh, set up an account. It's a great website. Um, also, if you have a, a pair of uh, cyan red glasses, that will help you a lot. I have my pair right here in front of me. I will use them later on in the tutorial, and so will you if you have them. You don't have to, but it helps a lot because then you can actually see the final effect. This is a very inexpensive way to preview the 3D. Obviously, if this were going to go into a movie theater, you would be using uh, a different final delivery than the red cyan glasses. Uh, they're quite cheap. Here's a 10-pack for $2. I think it's reasonably good reviews, but you want to get those as well. Okay, so once you've downloaded uh, this file from Ben Danzi on BlendSwap, you're going to open it up in Blender 275. Again, we're in Blender 275, and here is Ben's uh, default setup. He's got, or at least for this project, I'm going to go into the top view here like he had it. He's got some lights. He's got a floor, there's a camera in here, and he's got his model. What we're gonna do is we're gonna delete everything except for the model. So we're gonna select the model, and then we're gonna press Control I, which inverts the selection. And then we're gonna press X. And that's gonna delete everything except for the model, okay? We're just sort of gonna start from scratch with this guy. Now you'll notice, if you look at the size of the grid here, uh, he's very large. So we're just gonna start by scaling him down. He's selected, we're gonna press S and 0.1. That'll scale him down a bit. I'm gonna press the period key on my numeric keypad to zoom in on him here. This is getting a bit closer to the size uh, we're used to. I'm going to press Control A and tell it to apply the scale. What's gonna happen is right now my scale is 0.1. If I press Control A scale, my scale now becomes one, which is just good form to do that sort of thing fairly regularly when you're doing any kind of scaling. Um, we're now going to do just a little bit of cleanup on this. I'm gonna go into side view by pressing the number one. I'm gonna press Z to go into wireframe and tab to go into edit mode. I'm gonna press A to deselect all these pixels, control tab to choose vertex selection, and then I'm gonna press B and I have a box select, and I'm gonna select the very, very bottom of the model. Now what that does, if I press Z to go back into solid mode, is it just selects everything on the bottom but nothing above it, okay? And I'm going to delete not the vertices but the faces here. So I'm gonna press X and I'm gonna delete faces and that takes away all this stuff on the bottom. So I'm gonna go into the side view again, press the letter Z to go into wireframe again, press the letter B again and do another selection of everything along the bottom which now will just be this ring of vertices and if I press uh, control space bar, you're probably already seeing this. I can see my uh, transform options here are exactly in the middle of all these vertices. And what I wanna do is I wanna move the origin of this model to that point, which will allow me to spin my model around that point. So the way you do that is uh, with all these vertices selected in edit mode, press shift S and choose cursor to selected. That sets my 3D cursor at that exact point in the middle of all these vertices. Press the tab key to come out, and then I'm gonna press Shift, Control, Alt, C. Three modifiers, Shift, Control, and Alt, and the letter C, and note that my model is selected when I press that, and I'm gonna choose set the origin to the 3D cursor. And now if I, if you just look here at what we've got, um, if I were to say rotate this guy along the Z axis, R, Z, he moves nice and relatively cleanly around this center base, which itself isn't uh, 
perfectly spherical because, you know, that's how Ben works. He makes everything look like it was extremely handmade and he does an excellent job of it, as we'll see as this tutorial progresses. Press Shift C, which will reset your 3D cursor to the center. And then with your model still selected, press Shift S and choose Selection to Cursor. And now the origin moves to the middle and now I have my pirate man exactly in the middle. Now we're gonna rotate this guy. I'm gonna rotate this guy from frame zero to 48. So I'm gonna start my animation at zero and I'm gonna end my animation at 48. So if I press shift left arrow, that takes me to the zero point in my timeline. And I'm going to move over rotation for Z, right click, insert single keyframe. Then I'm gonna go to frame 48, no, frame 49. So I'm gonna press the right arrow key once. Here it says 49, you could also just type it in. And I'm gonna set the Z rotation to 360 degrees. And I'm gonna right click and choose insert single keyframe. The reason I do that is because as the timeline moves up, when it gets to 48, the next frame is going to be 360 degrees. But instead of going to the next frame, it goes back to the beginning, which is zero degrees and anyone who pretty much lives on planet Earth knows that 360 degrees is the same as zero degrees. So if we play this, what you'll see is when it gets to the end, it's in the same location. All right, so that's pretty awesome. Let's just uh, frame up on this guy here in this window as well. We can watch him twice. Here we are moving along our happy pirate captain. Now one thing you'll notice is it slows down and then it speeds up and slows down and speeds up. We'd like it to be moving consistently the whole time and we can do that in our graph editor. So in this top window, choose graph editor. And if I select my model and then go into this window and press the home key, it will frame everything up. You can see the shape of this movement along Z, uh, Z rotation from zero to 360 it's gonna start out slowly and then start to go faster up and then taper off. If I select all, just toggle the letter A till everything's selected, press the letter V and choose vector. That makes each point travel directly towards wherever the next point is. In other words, it moves, if you're into After Effects, it does what you'd call a linear keyframe. All right, so here he's moving around and you can see he's not speeding up or slowing down and when he gets to frame 48, you can't even tell that you're back at the beginning of the animation. It looks like he's just spinning forever and ever. Before we can move much further in our 3D animation, we need to set up a camera, but in order to set up that camera, we wanna make sure we have our settings correct on the final video. So right now it's 2048 by 1537. We're just gonna do regular HD, which is 1920 by 1080, okay? And uh, I'm gonna set this to 50%. You can render it 100%. Um, I'll probably render 50% just to keep things sped up. I like to run at 23.976 or 23.98. Personally, I prefer it to uh, 24 frames per second. It really doesn't matter. Now we're going to create a floor. So let's go mesh, plane, and scale up a floor. And now we're going to create a camera. Let me just move this over a bit. I think this will be our main working window. Let's create a camera, shift A, camera. Once I've created a camera, you'll see it's there in the middle. And by default, when you create a camera, they give it uh, some rotation values that you really don't want. So I'm gonna press option R or alt R, which will reset my rotation so it's facing straight down. Once I've done that now, I can rotate along the X axis, R, X, and punch in the number 90. You can see I've rotated along that 90 degrees. And uh, now I'm going to pull my camera back. And now I'm gonna press the number zero so I can see what's actually going on in my camera. I'm gonna move it up a bit. And really to make, 3D works a lot better, I have found. When the camera lens, the focal length is fairly short, a wide angled lens. So with my camera selected, I'm gonna go into my camera properties and change my focal length from 35 to about 16 millimeters. Okay, that means I've gotta move my camera in a bit closer. And what I think I'll do is I'll just play so I can see him spinning there. And while he's spinning, I'm just sort of gonna look at how that looks. Let's see. I might move up just a teeny bit, maybe a teeny bit closer. I'll just keep fiddling around. 
So let's say we're, uh, we're happy with that. Okay, with that setup. And now I need to set up my floor so that uh, I don't go into absolute nothingness here. And look, an easy way to do that, at least a way that I like to do that, is um, go into tab mode, just tab into edit mode for your floor, choose edge select, and select the edge that's opposite the camera. So here's my camera. I'm gonna select that edge, and I'm gonna curve that edge up. There's a really fun way to do that, okay? I've gone into my right orthographic view, which is the number three, and I'm gonna click above directly above this edge. So here's my edge, push number three again, directly above it, more or less, with my mouse. And the higher it goes, the more gradual this upward curve will be. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change my pivot center from the median point, like it is now, to the 3D cursor. And now you see the, the edge hasn't moved, but the pivot point has moved. I'm going to press the letter E to extrude and then R to rotate. And you can see how it's rotating around that new pivot point. I'm gonna rotate it just a little bit. Okay, E, R again, just a little bit. And if we want, if I wanted to, what I can do next is just press Shift R, which repeats the previous step. And I'll keep doing that until it's pretty much out of sight, which it is right there. And then I'll do one more E and press the Z and it'll just sort of extrude straight up a little more. And so I've, been able, I've created this nice curve with basically the, the 3D point as the focal point of that curve. I'll move back into my regular median point setting for my pivot. And I'm gonna select all and I'm gonna scale it along the X axis, S and then X, until these edges have completely covered the entire scope of the visual area, the screen here. So S, X, move it out. For good measure, I really don't think you need to do this. I'm gonna control R and then roll my mouse wheel up here to make a few extra faces, sometimes that helps. And I'm gonna press the space bar and type in smooth, shade, smooth. All right, so here I have a nice pirate man. If I went into cycles, there's our pirate man. You can barely see him and that's okay because now we're going to set up our materials. So we are going to go into our node editor on this top window. There's the default node here, the default material which is being called plastic. I'm just gonna delete that altogether by clicking the X. I'm gonna click new, and that's gonna give me kind of a simple diffuse color. Okay, I'm gonna press Shift Z to go into the, the view here. I'm gonna select the floor and do a new as well. I'm gonna call this material floor. I'm gonna make this floor just darker, probably a dark color. Really to see what's going on though, we need a light. So let's uh, press Shift S to move our selection, our cursor to the center. And I'm gonna up the, the speed of my fan here just to keep the computer a little cool so you might hear some fan noise in the background. I'm gonna press Shift A and I am going to add a sun. I'm gonna move that sun up just so I can look at it. Nice thing about the sun is that it doesn't matter where it is. Uh, it only has direction, it does not have location. Sunlight shines everywhere. Right now the sun is shining straight down on the pirate captain. And we're gonna change that a little bit. Uh, rotate along the x-axis a wee bit, and maybe then rotate along the z-axis a bit until we get something that's just kind of interesting. Yeah, I kind of like the shadow going there off to the right. Maybe we'll go with that. And uh, maybe I'll move that sun over there just out of the way. It's not gonna matter. Again, the position does not matter of the sun. And uh, I have control over the emission strength of the sun. I'm maybe gonna up it a little bit. Let's say, ah, actually no, I'm gonna keep it at one. You do have control over the size of the sun. So notice the, uh, the softness of the shadow here. I'm gonna type in point zero 0.01. You'll notice my shadows get much tighter, much more crisp, and that's because the sun would be smaller. Think of it as putting some diffuse over a light. If you've done lighting on a thing, the big, big box lights make very soft shadows. A cloudy day, you have really soft shadows because the clouds are diffusing all that light. It's a very large light source, as opposed to a .001 light, which is gonna give you an extremely crisp edge. So I'm gonna set the size to .3. I think looks pretty good. Oh, back in camera mode. Okay. So there's, this, is our, this is our starting point. It's a good starting point. I'm gonna select my floor, make it just a tiny bit darker. Yeah, about like that. Help the pirate man stand out just a little bit. Now we're gonna, we're gonna do a little thing to our pirate here, uh, to his material. We're gonna add some pointiness to him. So 
Let me just give you a quick demonstration of what pointiness does. If we choose, I call this material, let's name it now to pirate, our pirate material. Shift A, input, geometry, which gives us various pieces of information about the geometry that we're working with. There is a feature relatively new called pointiness. If I plug pointiness right into diffuse, you're not gonna see a lot happen. It's hard to see exactly what's going on, but what it does is it makes these little creases a bit darker, kind of like the dirt pass you can do with vertex painting. It's very, very similar, only this, because this is procedural, so it happens, um, it updates automatically all the time. I'm gonna go into color, brightness and contrast, and I'm gonna increase the contrast on that a lot. And as I do that, you'll really start to see what this material does. This is way too much, obviously, but it emphasizes the creases that happen in Ben's sculpture here. So we can see some of the things that, these nice little grooves and stuff that he's carved out. I'm gonna set my contrast to maybe, I don't know, 20? Maybe that's too much, 10? Well, you know, it really doesn't matter because I'm gonna disconnect that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add another diffuse. I'm gonna add and combine these two together with a mix shader, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the pointiness rather than as a color input, I'm gonna make it uh, the mix factor between these two diffuses. So if I set one of these diffuses to be a darker color, okay, actually I've got this wrong because white is red as one, black is red as zero, and this shader, or the top number, is every time you get zero you see this, every time you get one you see this, and then it mixes in between. So really I want my darker color to be on top because that's gonna have the zero input. So now I'm getting something similar to what I had before, but what I can do now is I could say um, up my contrast a lot. And now instead of having it be black, I can have it be maybe some sort of darkish yellow color. You see, and this gives me a lot more control over what I'd like to do. That's too much. We can turn our contrast down. Maybe we'll have it around 20. And I also can control the brightness, which is sort of the overall paintingness of it. If I make my brightness down to a negative number, you can get a, a look kind of like that, which is pretty interesting. I mean, really, it's very interesting, especially for these really finely um, shaped objects like this one here. Or you can move it up. I think I'll probably set this around minus 0.1 contrast. That looks pretty good. Around 20. Yeah, I'm, I, think I'm, I think I'm pretty happy with that. I think I am going to increase the brightness of my sun just a little bit, maybe to 1.2. There we are. That's looking pretty good. And now that that's all taken care of, it is time to go 3D. That is, it's time to go with our red cyan glasses. So get your red cyan glasses handy, and here's how you do it. You start by going into your Layer Properties tab and checking the box, this new attribute here called Views. So you check the Views box, and immediately this pirate goes all red and cyan on us. And if you put on your glasses right now, it will go all 3D. Probably not so much in the YouTube video. Compressed videos have a hard time showing this, um, but certainly if you're at home on your computer or at the, at the office and you put on the glasses, you will see this. And honestly, it's gonna look really cool. Uh, when I first did this, I was just amazed at how good this looked just right out of the box with their default settings. Now, if I select my camera, let's go ahead and go through some of the things we're gonna do next here. I'm gonna select my camera and I, I had to press, I don't know why I had to do this, but I had to press control zero on the numeric keypad to make my camera the active camera. It's also the only camera, but that in order, I had to do that in order to see this little extra window show up. And this window represents what's called, I believe the convergence plane, okay? If I select my camera properties, I see here a new uh, thing called stereoscopy, stereoscopy. I'm not sure how you pronounce that word, but I'm gonna say stereoscopy. I'm gonna say that. Our convergence plane, as I make that longer or shorter, you will see this screen kind of moving back. Okay, what does that mean? That means that's the part where uh, everything that falls along this plane, if you're wearing glasses, will look exactly the same on the red and cyan glasses. Okay, which means our eyes will register them as being exactly overlapping. And so the visual effect of that is that it sits exactly on the screen rather than a bit behind the screen or a bit in front of the screen. Now I'm gonna put this whole pirate in front of the screen. So I'm gonna move this uh, behind him. You'll notice it also gets larger, which is just so that as it goes away, it's gotta get larger so that it can fill this camera screen. Shouldn't be 
I mean, that makes pretty good sense. Let's set this to 15. And then the interocular distance, you'll notice in the note it says, set the distance between the eyes, the stereo plane distance divided by 30 should be fine. Okay, which means this convergence plane divided by 30. So 15 divided by 30, I'll just type that in, 15 divided by 30. And I get 0.5, and you'll notice my pirate just splits up again. I'm gonna put on my glasses here real quick so I can see what this looks like. And uh, whoa, ho, ho, fancy. That's pretty exciting. I think I might wanna move my camera up just a little bit. In fact, I might even move him back a little bit. Just a little though. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Definitely looking 3D there to me. Now, if you don't have glasses, when you're in your camera view, let me just shift space bar this to go into full screen with my camera view. Press the letter N to get into your properties here. And you'll notice there is a new option here called, wait for it, stereoscopy. Right now it's set to 3D, but I can choose right, meaning the right eye, I'm pretty sure, or left, meaning the left eye, right, Left, right, left, right, left. I could do it real fast. And eventually my hand would start to hurt. So you don't have to look at it in 3D when you're working in 3D, okay? These other options are for when you are not in the camera view. So if I choose, uh, right now I've got plane enabled, which means I can see this convergence plane. I can disable that. If I choose cameras, it shows the distance between the two cameras. So in theory, this would be my two eyeballs. So you can sort of see that his eyeballs, the space between these eyeballs are pretty close, maybe a little bit larger than the eyeballs on the pirate. So that would make this statue probably seem like it's just a little bit smaller than real life. Uh, and a third option is to turn on volume, which is going to shade a cyan and red volume box. I need to up the alpha on that to really see it, but there you can see it uh, when there's not that plane behind it. Uh, or if I go into wireframe mode, here's my cyan, here's my red. So um, use those if you like. They're available to be used if you think it's gonna help you. I'm gonna go back into 3D view. Back into the small thing, press the letter N to come out of that. And I'm gonna add one more element that we can just uh, add into this in the background. We're gonna do shift, let's go over here. Shift A, add some text. Press the letter Z so we can see what's going on here. There's my text, I'm going to Move it back a bit. I think I'll keep it in front of the convergence plane though. R, X, rotate on the X axis, type in 90. There we go. Gonna move that up a little bit. And I'm just gonna press the tab key to enter into edit mode for the text. And now I'm gonna delete that. I'm gonna type in blender, space, maybe lots of spaces actually. A, N, A, G, L, Y, P, H. Blender, anaglyph. And I am going to change the paragraph attributes under my font properties to be center, so it's centered. And uh, I will probably just scale it up a bit. Scale, scale, scale. And uh, maybe I will go into edit mode again and just add a few more spaces there. I want the pirate guy to kind of cover it up, but not entirely cover it up. So as he spins, yeah. Now, if you're noticing, one thing cool about Blender is that not only do the surfaces have 3D characteristics to them, but for instance, this the grid itself splits between the right and left eye, the cyan, and the red imagery, which is pretty awesome. The wireframe also does it. My, uh, my sunlight line is doing it right here. It's kind of hard to see, but it's there. Just a fun little thing that it's got. Okay, uh, just a little more work on this text here. Let me select the text. We are going to uh, give it the same material as our pirate, first of all, pirate. And I am going to extrude it a little bit. In other words, make it thick here. You can see it happening. Um, and just a couple things I do with the default blender text, I think make it look a little bit better. We're gonna offset it to minus 0.01, which will shrink the text a little bit. And then I'm going to add depth of 0 0.01, so they're gonna offset each other. But what that's gonna give me is the opportunity to add a little bit of a bevel. I'm going to up that resolution to, let's say, eight, nine, 10, somewhere around there. That looks good. 
Now I've got just a little more depth to that. So as I get into here, we can see a little more depth. It just gives us a little more play with the 3D elements. Um, not just the 3D glasses, but just the dimensionality of the scene itself. So that's nice. And if I go into my cycles mode, one thing important to know about cycles is cycles does not preview in 3D. You're only gonna get the 3D cycle in solid or wireframe mode. Once you go into cycles for the cycles preview, it's just gonna give you one eye. So here is our final animation, at least I think it is, as Pirate Man spins over the words Blender Anaglyph. And if you're wearing Blender glasses, I'm sorry, not Blender glasses, but 3D glasses, uh, you'll have a really fun experience. I'm gonna move this camera down just a little bit. Okay, there we go. So when that cape gets close to us, there's a really big separation between them. Uh, and then when the, I say cape, when the back of his shirt, back of his uh, coat is far away from us, they're much closer together. That's the effect of having this look. All right, it's about time to start rendering. So let's go into our render properties. And a couple more things we wanna change. First, we wanna change our output. I'm gonna press slash slash render. The slash slash means it's gonna save this to wherever our file is currently saved. I'm gonna hit another slash and then I'm just gonna call this pirate anaglyph underscore pound 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 dot png. It's very important that you save this to a uh, lossless image, like a png, uh, a tiff will do it. You do not wanna save to something like a JPEG, okay? A JPEG image is going to do compression and it's gonna have a hard time when the cyan and red image overlap, assuming we're saving it as a cyan and red image, which we will be doing for this tutorial. You'll get some aliasing, some funky imagery, and when you put on those glasses and look at the rendered image, it's going to stand out. You're gonna see these little edges where they overlap that shouldn't be there, but the JPEG is writing that, the JPEG image is creating that, and not Blender. If you save it as something like a PNG, you're not gonna have that problem. And this is one of the reasons why these things don't look super good on something like YouTube. Uh, it just has a hard time working with that codec. There are some codecs people have written to work specifically with the red cyan 3D anaglyph movies. Um, so with that set up, our PNG set up, uh, we're going to look at our samples. Uh, ben, this was designed for a still, his render samples were really high, a thousand. We're going to change that down to maybe 150, and preview doesn't really matter, but why not? We'll go down to 150. And now let's press F12 to render one frame. And one thing you'll notice right away is that it's rendering out a red image. As I said before, it has to render this twice has to render one eye and then the other eye. Right now it's rendering red. You'll notice at the bottom of the render window now is this little cyan red camera looking thingy. Uh, that means I'm looking at it as a red cyan image, but if I click on that and disable it, I now have a new option that currently says left and it's showing me the left eye. I could also watch the right eye, which you will notice is completely blank because it hasn't rendered the right eye yet. But again, you have this option, if you don't have glasses, to compare the right eye and left eye, okay? Or you can look at them together. So now as we look at them together, I can see that cyan and red overlapping. I could stick on my glasses now and I could bask in the joy of what it's doing. Or I can look at my right image, which is still being drawn, versus my left image, if I do it real quick, even as it's in the middle of rendering, you can sort of see how it kind of shifts back and forth. There's probably a hotkey to toggle. If not, there should be. It'd be great to be able to toggle back and forth between these real quickly. Uh, you see that little back and forth shake. It gives you a good sense of uh, the depth that you're gonna be getting in this one. And uh, boy, that pointiness, it, it looks cool. It's a bit heavy handed. Apologies, apologies people. But uh, that's what we've got. So there's our final render, our right channel and our left channel. And here it is in full 3D. And let me just stick on my glasses for a second and look at it. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Woo! 
That is exciting. I don't know. I mean, someday we'll get bored of this, but right now, this is so exciting. This is so cool. In fact, as I move my mouse over this, my mouse looks like it's actually behind the text just a little bit when I'm wearing the glasses, and that's because my mouse in both the left and right eye is exactly in the same spot. And that convergence plane, as you remember when we modeled this, is behind the words Blender Anaglyph. And so that's kind of weird when I move my mouse over the letters because I think it should be going behind them, and it doesn't, and that just goes to show that this thing is working really, really nicely. Oh, I just gotta say, the Blender community, these, these Blender coders are just awesome. I just wanna give them a super big hug. What we should really do is support them, go on the communities, make tutorials, buy some of their books, contribute, um, report bugs, do all that good stuff. That's awesome. All right, so it's time to render. First thing we need to do is we, we should probably save this project as something else, unless you wanna save it as Plunderbus Pete, the original file. I'm just gonna press uh, Control Shift S, and I'm gonna save it in uh, a directory, and I'm gonna call this the 3D Anaglyph Pirate. There we go. Oh, sorry, let's save that. There we go, now it's saved. I am going to add a noise pattern that changes from frame to frame called uh, there's a really nice way to do it now. You click this little stopwatch next to the word seed under sampling. That just means that you're going to have a different noise pattern. There's always going to be a little bit of grain. Think of it like film grain. And you used to have to put in a little bit of code here. Now you don't have to. Click that and you're good to go. The last thing we need to do, again, I, I pointed out that the, uh, the anaglyph options are kind of spread out. The last place where you're going to find it is in the output. Now under output, We've already looked at how we want to use a PNG, but you have a views format. There's individual and there's stereo 3D. We're going to choose stereo 3D anaglyph, okay? Which means the images are going to be overlapped and we're going to choose red cyan. You could do other colors. We're going to do red cyan, which is by far the most common. If I chose individual, it would render out the full image. In other words, it would give me this image and it would give me this image and it would call the left one pirate anaglyph underscore zero 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 one underscore L and this one it would call pirate anaglyph underscore zero 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 underscore R and then it would be my job later on to combine those together or if this were going into a movie theater that we're using polarized light technology and things like that then I could give them the two separate video tracks and it could project those properly but for our for our purposes we are going to combine them together in our render just like this and so we're going to choose stereo 3D under our views format. So again, just to review the places where you find the settings for this, under the layer properties, you have to enable views, okay? And you're going to choose stereo 3D. Don't worry about multi-view, that's a different thing, to some extent, different thing. We're going to choose stereo 3D, okay? Then you're also going to click on your camera properties with your camera selected, and here you can set your stereoscopy settings such as where the convergence plane is going to be which, as you see, really matters. In this case, I'm putting it behind everything so everything kind of pops out. You don't have to do that. You could put it in front of everything so it looks like everything's moving back. You could put it right in the middle so things start behind you and then come out close to you. You're also gonna set your interocular distance, which is basically math, divide this number by 30. And then in your render window, you have some additional options to view it, left, right. Um, and then finally in your Render settings under output, you have to actually specify whether you want two separate files or whether you want them to be merged together and then how you want that to happen. I also want to do one more thing real quick. I want to go into my nodes, go into my compositing nodes, check use nodes, and uh, let me just press the letter T so I can see what's going on here. I can see that my light right now is from about, uh, you know, it's, it's, it gets relatively dark, but it's not getting super bright. So if I just add a color, let's do a hue saturation value, up my value a bit to make this whole thing brighter, okay? What's important to point out here is that these settings, even though I'm just going through one pipeline, image into everything else, really it's doing it to the left and the right and then it's combining them together. So this is not gonna mess with the actual color of the cyan, the color of the red. It's only gonna mess with the color of this, okay, and this, 
and then it combines them together after it does everything. So that's, that's terrific. That means I can fiddle with things, I can add stuff, I can vignette it, I can do whatever I'm gonna do, and then later on it's going to combine those together as the final composite if you're going to use the Stereo 3D as your output view. One more time with the glasses just to get real excited. And that really does look exciting. It's really cool. Um, boy, go get some glasses, run through this tutorial, and uh, try this out. It is awesome. Okay, so we're gonna save this. Everything is set up, and uh, it's time to render. Here we go. Looks like it's going to take about one minute per frame. I've got 48, that's gonna take about 48 minutes to render, which for an animation is very acceptable. And uh, we'll let that go, and then we'll take a look at the final product. All right, there we go. Let's um, play rendered animation. Here is our rendered animation, and uh, ho ho, woo! It's exciting with the glasses on, I'll tell you what folks. You gotta try it with the glasses. Get yourself some glasses, try it out. And I hope you learned something in this tutorial. And I hope you have a good time using this new feature, finding things you can do with it. This is just a basic overview. Uh, there's lots of exciting stuff I'm sure we'll be able to figure out. I think smoke is gonna get real exciting with this and other things, so uh, happy blendering.